Okay, so let's take a look at the list data type, collection type in Python, which is somewhat like an array in languages like Java or C++. We can define a list literal by enclosing a sequence of values in square brackets separated with commas from each other. Here I'm using a variable m to refer to this list that's initialized to contain 7, 2, 3, and 0. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> Not O. Oh. 7, 2, 3, and 0. Okay, there we go. Uh, so M, when I display M, the representation is the same as the representation I used when I defined the uh, value for M to refer to. The type of the thing that M refers to is list, and I can index into my list using subscripts starting from zero, similarly to how I would do this in Java or C++. So M sub zero is the item value seven, M sub three is the item value zero. I can also use negative subscripts in Python and these behave differently from negative indexes in C and C++. That is, the minus one is the final element in the list, or item in the list. Minus two would be the second to last element. Minus three would be the third to last element, and so forth. Okay, so m sub one is the value two. m sub minus one, as I said, is the final element in this list whose value is zero. M sub minus four is the first item in the list whose value is seven. Now, Python does not allow you to go outside the bounds of a list. So if I ask for item, well, let me redisplay M so that it doesn't disappear off the top of our screen here. All right, so there's M. M sub five is an error. Likewise, M sub minus 5 is an error. So I'm only allowed to use indexes in this list of four items from 0 up to including 3, or from minus 1 down to and including minus 4 to count backwards. A list is mutable, that is, items within the list can be modified. m sub 2 currently contains three. If I say m sub two gets a five, now that three has been modified and replaced with a five, okay? I can use plus for concatenation and times for repetition, similarly to how these operators are used for stir objects. So here's m. 7250, and if I compute m plus, or concatenated with, the list 471, I get the list 2, <laughs> sorry, 7250471. Now, that list is computed and displayed on the screen, but I didn't modify m by doing that addition. I just used a copy of M and appended to that this list 471. If I want to get a list of 100 zeros, let's say, I can just ask for 0 times 100 and poof, there's my list of 100 zeros. All right, so concatenation and repetition use plus and times or star. In addition to the symbolic operations, square bracket for subscripting, plus for concatenating, and star for rep repetition, the list collection type also provides many named methods or named operations, such as append. All right, whoops, sorry. So here's m. If I say m.append, 
let's see what the value is on slide 29. Minus 6. Okay, so m dot append minus 6. That will append minus 6 to the end of that list m. So now m contains 7250 minus 6. Append always goes at the back. And for those of you that are familiar with C++'s standard library, this is like a pushback on a vector. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. Append always goes at the end of the list. Insert, on the other hand, allows you to insert a value ahead of some arbitrary valid index within the list. So if I were to say m.insert 0, comma, minus 6. Now index 0 is the index of the 7. m.insert ahead of item 0, minus 6 is going to put a minus 6 at the front of the list. All right, even if I say m.insert, let's say, 3, comma, minus 6. Well, let's see, where is m sub 3? 0, 1, 2, 3. So m sub 3 is the 5, and I'm going to insert a minus 6 ahead of that 5. All right, so now my list has 7 items in it, following an append and two inserts. Remove removes just the first match of some value. If I say m.remove2, let's say, then the first 2 gets removed from m. If I say m.remove-6, then only the first minus 6 is eliminated from m. The trailing 2 minus 6s, or the later 2 minus 6s, remain. Pop m dot pop with no argument removes the final item from the list and also returns that value so not only does m dot pop remove the minus six from the end but it also returns to me the minus six as well all right so i could say for example uh, val gets m dot pop here val is a new variable that I'm creating. It's going to refer to whatever, va whatever value m.pop returns, which will be the zero. All right, so m no longer contains the zero. val refers to the zero. I can also pop from some arbitrary location. For example, let's say one, that's going to take item sub 1, the minus 6, out of the list M. Well, goodness, I've pretty well wrecked my list at this point, so let me, uh, let me say M plus gets. Okay, plus gets, remember, means is the same as saying M gets M plus something, and I can concatenate some list onto the end of M. Let me concatenate I'm going to copy and paste this list from way back there. Whoops. Okay, so now M has a bunch of stuff in it once again. A couple of sevens, a couple of fives, a zero, three minus sixes. Let's just for gags uh, insert in position two a two or ahead of position 2. So that inserted ahead of this minus 6, the value 2. There we go. I can count how many times a value occurs within the list. All right, if I count the occurrences of 1, there are none, so I get 0. If I count the occurrences of 2, I get 1. If I count the 7s, there's two of those. If I count the minus sixes, there are three of those. Okay. I can also sort the list. And sorting the list works in place. I don't get any output when I do this. But the items within this list M 
are sorted in non-descending order. You can think of it as ascending order, but technically it's non-descending order. So after I've done the sort, here is my modified list. I can also reverse the contents of the list. And of course now I've got them in descending or non-ascending order. All right, so on these next couple of slides, 29, well, evidently just 29, are examples similar to those that I've shown you on the screen here. All right, well, now that we're starting to type input or values that are fairly long, we need to define some terms and discuss a nasty feature of Python. We need to know what the difference is between a so-called logical line and a physical line and why we should care. So a statement, which is something like an arithmetic expression or an assignment or the execution of some method like count or sort or reverse on a list, has to be contained on a single logical line. For example, if I were to say x gets 12, that is a statement that creates the variable x and assigns x to refer to the value 12. And that is both a physical line and a logical line all at once. If I attempt to split that statement by typing a new line character at some point, that splits this logical line across two physical lines. And Python is very upset about that. If I were to say x gets and now press the enter key to try to continue my statement on the next line down, Python yells at me. Now, in Java, C, C++, which are free format languages, this would not be a problem. I could just say x gets and hit the enter key and then type 12 uh, on the next line down, probably followed by a semicolon in those example languages. But to make Python happy, if I want to split a logical line across multiple physical lines, what I need to do, or one thing I can do, is to put a backslash at the end of the physical line, and that enables me to paste together the first physical line and the following physical line together into a single logical line. So I'm gonna say x gets, and then backslash enter, and now I can type my 12, and Python is happy. All right, so the, the backslash is the logical line continuation character it enables me to split a logical line across multiple physical lines. In fact, I can do things like saying x backslash enter, backslash enter, gets backslash enter, backslash enter, 12, backslash enter, enter. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, s I created way long ago, creating uh, containing high. Here's x. Uh, x refers to 12. Now, another way that you can extend a logical line across multiple physical lines is by enclosing characters in parentheses, such as we've used in arithmetic expressions, or square brackets, such as we have just used for defining a literal list of items, uh, or curly braces, which we will see actually in next week's lecture if we're defining things like sets or dictionaries. Okay, so one silly way of storing 12 into x without using the backslash is to say x gets, open parenthesis, and now I can just type as much as I want, eventually hit my 12 and my closing parenthesis. Well, 12 in parentheses is just 12. So that's a way of assigning the value 12 to x. I can enclose a arithmetic expression 
in parentheses as well. This just computes 12 minus 7, so that x is now referring to 5. I previously defined m by saying m gets, now I've forgotten the exact numbers, but it was something like 7, 3, 2, 0, all on a single line. But as shown here on slide 32, once I've typed my opening square bracket, I can continue typing more values on as many lines as I wish until eventually I get around to typing the closing square bracket that concludes my list of item values. Okay, so here n is a list containing the three items 12, 13, and 9. All right, so either using the backslash or by enclosing a sequence of values in parentheses or square brackets, we've seen how you can split a logical line across multiple physical lines if you need to. On the flip side, it turns out you can define multiple logical lines on a single physical line by separating the logical lines from each other with semicolons. Now, in Python, semicolon here is the logical line separator. It is not a statement terminator as it is in Java or C++ or C. So when I say A gets 4, that is a logical line. That is a statement on a logical line. And if I then type a semicolon, I can type another statement on the same physical line, but this is a different logical line. And then I'm also going to say semicolon and C gets the string X. All right, so I've, to create, I've created a variable A referring to the int value 4, B referring to the float value 12.5, and C referring to the stir value X. I do want to point out something here for those of you who do know something about Java or C++ or C, that... Python does not have a separate idea of a care, a single care value the way that those other languages do. Single quotes containing one character is still treated as a string as far as Python is concerned. And if I ask for the type of this variable C, I get told, okay, this thing is a stir, not a single care. If I would like to find out how long a container is, a, a collection is, or, or for that matter, how long a string is, I can use the len built-in function for that. So if I've got this list sitting around m, and if I ask for the length of m, I get told that has nine items in it. If I ask for the length of a literal list, whoops, 1, 5, 3, 19, let's say. Okay, I've typed a literal list here as the argument to my len function. That list has four items in it. A string is also a collection as far as uh, len is concerned. So I can use the len function to find out how long a string happens to be. Let's see now. I defined... Well, well, okay, so, so len tells me how many characters there are in a string or how many items there are in a list. Later we'll also see that we can use len to find out how many items there are in a set or how many items there are in a tuple uh, and so on. So both list and stir are what are called sequence types. That is, you can index into them using integer subscripts from 0 up to whatever the maximum legal subscript is. Uh, I have not illustrated this using stirs, so let's do that. Let me create s to refer to this is a test. So the len, <laughs> the len of s is 14. 
we saw that I can say things like m sub 2 to get the sub 2 item out of the list m. I can do the same thing with a string. I can say s sub 2 to get the second item out of the string s. In particular here, what I'm getting is the one character wide substring starting at position sub 2 within s. Uh, s sub 0 is the first t. Uh, s sub minus 1 is the last character, which also happens to be a t. All right, so I can index forward from 0 up to 13, or I can index backward from minus 1 to minus 14 within this string. Any sequence can be sliced by using this colon notation. So a slice of a sequence, let's do this with uh, M, a slice of a sequence is obtained by uh, giving an initial index, let's say 2, and a colon, and one past a final index, let's say uh, 5 here. 0, 1, 2, 3, yes. So 5 would be the position of the 0. And let me also choose a step size of 2 for this slice. Okay, so I is the initial item. J is one past the final item. And K is the step size. And here I'm choosing a step size of 2. So what I'm going to get is the 5. That's item sub 2. Then I'm going to skip an item. Then I will get this item 2 here. And when I get to the 0, I've actually gone one beyond the end, so I'll stop. So I simply get a list, a slice of that original list that happens to be two items wide in this case. I get this 5 and this 2. Most often the, the uh, step size is just 1, and it turns out, in fact, that in that case, if you leave out that third part of the slice, then it defaults to a step size of 1 anyway. All right, so what I can say here as an example is m sub, oh, let's say 1 colon 4, and that gets me from item sub 1, 2, 3, up to but not including item sub 4. So the 2 is not included. I get those three items in my slice from m. All right, let me type in this ages example. Ages is a list of, maybe these are ages of members of a family here. All right, so ages sub 0 colon 3. Let's see. Sub 3 is the 33 here. 0 colon 3 means from item sub 0 up to but not including item sub 3. So that's going to be the 3, 12, 5. On the other hand, if I say ages sub 3 colon 5. Now, if I attempted to use just plain 5 as an index into ages, that would be an error because that's one past the end. But if I ask for a slice from 3 up to but not including 5, that's okay, okay? 5 is 1 beyond the end, but that's okay. So I'm going to get item sub 3 and item sub 4, but not item sub 5. And that gives me the 33 and the 68. Okay, so here's ages again, just as a reminder. 0 colon 2 just gives me the first two items from item 0 up to but not including item sub 2. If I leave out the first index, then 0 is assumed by default. So ages sub 0 colon 2 
is equivalent to just saying ages sub colon 2. The 0 is implied there. Likewise, if I leave off the final index, the, the j part, then the assumption is that I want to go all the way to the end of the list. So if I say ages sub 2 colon, all right, so ages sub colon 2 means sub 0, sub 1, but not sub 2. Ages sub 2 colon means sub 2, 3, 4, and since item sub 4 is the last one in the list, that's the last one that I get. Okay, it's equivalent <laughs> it's equivalent, according to the slide here, to having the length of the sequence as the value one past the end, and of course that's the case. Since there are five items in ages, then asking for ages sub 2 colon 5 does give me the final three items in that ages list. Now we can combine slicing with concatenating using the plus sign to create reordered lists using pieces of other lists. Here I'm going to create this list A referring to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Five, six, seven. All right, so A is eight items long. And if I set B to A sub four colon plus A sub one colon four. Okay, well, let's see if we can figure this out. So A sub zero is zero. That's pretty... <laughs> pretty boring. Um, a sub 4 is the value 4. So a sub 4 through the end is going to be the 4, 5, 6, 7. And a sub 1 up to but not including 4 is going to be the 1, 2, 3. So the upshot here is that b is going to be a list containing 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3. All right, so we're grabbing a couple of slices from A and changing the order of those slices and concatenating them together to get B. Now, this doesn't have any effect on A. A is still what it was before. I can do slicing on literal strings or lists. So here I have a literal string, hello. And if I ask for the slice, up to but not including characters sub 3, that's going to give me characters sub 0, 1, and 2. If I then append another string, p exclamation mark, okay, I have the string help. And if I say s gets, s1, pardon me, gets international. Okay, I like to use international, or even better, internationalization, because there's so many interesting substrings that you can pull out of that word and to create other words. Um, and in fact, this is not one. Let me let me show you a, a, a word that's a word. Uh, for example, if I do two colon six, okay, there's we have turn. The example here, where I'm using colon colon two, means that I want to go from item sub zero, which is this character i, all the way to the end of the string, all the way to the last item, but I only want every other item. So what I'm going to get is i T, R, A, uh, I, N, 
L. So I trainal, which is not a word. And for my last trick, um, this is silly, but it illustrates the idea of using concatenation on slices of strings. Uh, S1 sub colon 8 really means 0 colon 8. So 0 colon 8 is going to be internet. But I only want every other character. And I'm going to append to that S1 sub 7 up to but not including 11. All right, so S1 sub colon 8 colon 2 is going to be itra. And I'm going to get the T in front of the itra. And then shun is going to be what I get from 7 through, uh, for 7 through 11. And <laughs> what? Oh, A1. Let's try this again. All right. So I want that part. But now I want S1. And 7 up to, but not including 11. And yay, titration is my result. All right. So I'll, I'll grant you that that's silly. But again, just illustrating the idea of how to use slices to grab subsections or subpieces of lists or stirs or other sequences. And then you can combine those things together using concatenation to create other uh, interesting combinations. Now, it turns out that almost anything in a Python program is an object. And this doesn't only include the things we think of as objects. So, so 5 is certainly an object, and 2.7 is certainly an object, and true is an object. But it turns out that things like functions and classes and so on are also objects in Python. Each object is identified by its ID number, and the ID numbers for different objects are distinct. If I ask for, right, here's my string s, if I ask for the ID of s, I get some value. I have a list n sitting around. If I ask for its ID, I get some value. In fact, len is a function that tells me how long some sequence is or some collection is. I can ask for the ID of len, and I'm told what its ID number is. Now, depending on how your version of the Python interpreter is implemented, that value that is displayed by the ID function may be the memory address of that object in memory, or it may not. But what is guaranteed is that different objects have different IDs. Here we have the ID of 7 for my shell. Remember that I said a variable refers to an object. The variable itself is not an object, as it turns out. If I say x gets 7, and then I ask for the ID of x, what I'm really doing is asking for the ID of the object that x is referring to. And what I get here is the same ID number that I got for the literal value 7. If I say y gets 7 and ask for the ID of y, again, I get exactly that same ID number. If I say z gets x, this does not mean that the variable z refers to the variable x. What it means is that the variable z refers to the same object that x refers to. And if I ask for the ID of z, once again, I get the same number. So uh, x refers to 7, y refers to 7, z refers to 7. These three variable names are all referring to the same object which is at a certain place in memory and has a certain ID, which, as I said, may or may not be the, the uh, location in memory. Here's the interesting thing about small integers. If I say, 
for example, w gets 18 and ask for the ID of w. Notice I'm getting an ID number that's not the same as the ID number for 7. But if I ask for w mod gets 11, this is equivalent, remember, to w gets w mod 11. Now the modulus gives me the remainder after division. If I divide 18 by 11, the remainder is 7. The upshot is that w now has the value 7. And it turns out that small integers, that is, integer values roughly between 0 and 127 or 0 and 255, I, I think it's 0 and 127, always have the same ID number. And so if I now ask for the ID of W, once again I get the same ID number as for the literal value 7. Now, if you define collections, it's possible for collections to have items that have the same values and yet still be different collections from each other and therefore have different IDs. Here on slide 41, I'm saying M gets a list containing 1, 2, and 3. I'm also going to, well, let me display the ID of M first. All right, so there's its ID. Now if I say N gets 1, 2, and 3, N, it turns out, is a different list that has its own unique ID. Now, why does this matter? Well, of course it matters because if I say m.append7, that modifies the items in m, but it does not modify the items in n. Okay, Even though the items in m have been modified, its ID is still the same as it was before. So it's the same list, but its items have been modified. On the other hand, if I say n gets m, this means, as I mentioned earlier with just plain ints, this means that I want n to refer to the same object that m refers to, and now the ID of n is going to be the same as the ID of m. And so now, of course, if I display the representation of n, it refers to the same object that m refers to. Okay, next we need to take a look at equality, relational, and logical operators. We want to be able to compare things and do logical comparisons as well as numerical comparisons. Here I've got these ranked from high precedence in the first row to low precedence down in the bottom row. And for those of you familiar with Java or C++, notice that there are some very different precedence rules going on here. For example, the is equal to test and is not equal to test are at the same level of precedence as the relational less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal. And not, logical not, which in Java or C++ is the exclamation mark character, actually has lower precedence than the equality and inequality tests and the relational tests. And has the third level, well, the second from the bottom level of precedence here, and at the very bottom we have or. It won't surprise you to understand that we use parentheses to either clarify or change the precedence of these things. In Python, we also have a couple of operators, is and is not, which have to do with comparing IDs of objects as opposed to values of objects. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of these things. If I have a equal to 5, sorry, I should say A gets 5, B gets 3, C gets 1. I can say things like, is A equal to B numerically? And that's false. 
or is A not equal to B numerically? And that's true. I can ask whether A is greater than B. That's true. Or A is less than or equal to B. That's false. Now, in Python, unlike C++ and Java, you can type a sequence of relational tests, which is evaluated with the usual mathematical meaning. So if I test whether A is greater than B, which in turn is greater than C, that is true. It's equivalent to asking whether A is greater than B and B is greater than C. That's the way I would have to evaluate that in a language such as Java or C++. But in Python, I can express it using the usual kind of mathematical shorthand. All of these equality, relational, and logical values are evaluated from left to right. Okay? And consequently, <clears throat> if I were to change my test and ask whether A is less than B, which in turn is greater than C, let's say, the A less than B will be evaluated first before the comparison between B and C. And because A less than B is false, in fact, we don't even bother to do the remaining part of that comparison. So this entire thing is false. This is what's called short circuit evaluation in uh, C++ and Java and other languages descended from the C language. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, is and is not are involved in comparing IDs of objects, whereas the is equal to test and the is not equal to test compare values. Now recall that I have this list M, and I also have N as another reference to that same list. If I ask whether M is equal to N, this is fine, it's perfectly acceptable to compare two collections for equality to each other. And those are equal in terms of the uh, size of the lists and the types of the lists and the values of all of the items in the list. I can ask whether M is N, and that's also true. Now, if I create a third list, let's call this thing uh, P, equal to 1, 2, or pardon me, P gets the list 1, 2, 3, 7. Now P is equal to M, but if I ask whether P is M, that is false. If I ask whether P is not M, that is true. Okay, so we can compare both values and IDs by using the double equal or exclamation mark equal for values and the words is or is not for IDs. All right, so here are some similar examples to what I've done previously. In this case, if I say A gets 12, B gets 12, Recall what we saw for small integer values. The ID of A and the ID of B and the ID of the literal value 12 are all the same. So it's true that A is equal to B. It's also true that A is B. If I ask whether not A equals B, now recall that in Python, not as low precedence. So whereas in C or C++ or Java, this would have been evaluated as not A equal B. In Python, it's evaluated as not A is equal to B. And so that's going to end up being false because A is equal to B and therefore not of true is false. So now that we know how to do equality and relational and logical tests, we can use the if decision structure in Python to decide 
conditionally whether to do some sequence of statements or not. The notation for an if consists of the keyword if <clears throat> followed by some Boolean expression such as a greater than 5, let's say, and a colon. It's very easy when you're getting new to when you're new to Python uh, to forget that colon, but you do need the colon at the end of that Boolean expression. Now, if the Boolean expression is true, we will execute whatever statements are contained within the if. And notice here that I've shown that these statements are indented. Python is obsessed with indentation. Everything within an if has to be indented, and furthermore, it also has to all be indented at exactly the same amount of spaces or, or tabs. All right, so I'm going to ask whether uh, a is greater than 5. Now, that's true. So I will say <coughs> uh, a times gets 3, let's say. And when I hit the Enter key another time, the test has been performed. Since a was greater than 5, that is 12 is greater than 5, a has been updated to 3 times its original value, therefore a is 36 in this case. All right, so in my interactive shell, in order to conclude my if decision, I had to type an extra blank line. Otherwise, the shell would have allowed me to continue typing more statements within the body of the if, and conveniently, the shell automatically handles the indentation for me. That's not necessarily true in all versions of the Python shell. So in some versions of the Python shell, you would have to manually do the indentation yourself. But here, I'm running the shell within the idle integrated development environment, and so I get this indentation behavior for free. All right, here are a couple of similar examples, or a couple of more examples, I should say. If I say A gets 12 and B gets 333, then I ask whether A is less than 30. Of course, that's true. In this case, I'm saying B gets A, and so B is going to be set to 12. And when I display B, I see that it is, in fact, 12. You can create a variable inside the body of your if decision. So if I say if A is equal to B, this is true because A is 12 and B is 12. And I'm creating another variable here. C gets, <laughs> well, I have to be able to type. OK, C gets minus 4. There we go. And B gets A plus C. Now, you might assume from other languages that you know, <laughs> and I keep repeating this phrase, Java or C++, <laughs> you might assume from having experience with one of those languages that this variable c is only going to be visible within this if decision. But in fact, that's not the case. In Python, when I create c here, c is a global top-level variable just like a and b. Okay, so now I'm going to hit a blank line to conclude this if decision, and I see that a is 12, b is now 8, all right, because C was set to refer to minus 4, and 12 plus minus 4 is 8, so B will be 8. And C also exists at this level and contains the value minus 4. So the, the scoping rules of variables in Python is not the same, not quite the same as the scoping rules in other languages you may be accustomed to. Now, here on slide 49, I'm not going to type this in, but notice that I've made a, well, <laughs> uh, I don't seem to be able to highlight the blank spaces here, but here I have typed the second statement within the body of this if decision with an extra space in front. And Python gets all kinds of upset about this and tells me, oh no, I have an indentation error because I didn't indent that B gets statement at the same level as the C gets statement. In fact, 
Python is so annoying and so persistent about indentation that if I even just accidentally hit a space and then said something like D gets 12, Python gets all angry about that initial space in front of the D as well. This is something that you'll just have to get used to. It's, it's, it's quite annoying, but there you are. It's just one of the rules. So what about these indentation rules and this business of physical and logical lines and so forth? Um, many people who come from a background language such as C or C++ or Java <laughs> that has... Uh, that is a free format language where all that matters is the order of the tokens and things like indentation and spacing don't really matter uh, except for spacing separating identifiers from each other, for example. Um, this indentation obsession that Python has is annoying at first. Uh, there is a good thing about it because basically it means that everybody who writes Python Sorry, everybody who writes Python code writes code that looks pretty much the same as everybody else's. And you don't have to keep track of pairs of opening and closing curly braces all over the place. The indentation just describes what is contained within an if decision, for example. Or soon we'll talk about loops or functions. And so the indentation describes what statements are contained within the loop, or what statements are contained within the function. On the other hand, uh, this business of line continuation, either by using a backslash or by remembering to put parentheses or square brackets around things, is pretty awkward. And another problem is that if you have, let's say, an if decision that has many lines of code in it, then your screen has a finite number of lines that can be displayed. And it can be very difficult for a long chunk of code in an if decision uh, to be able to see both the top of the decision and the bottom of the decision all at the same uh, all at the same time on your screen. Now one argument you can make from a software engineering standpoint is well gee you idiot if you have so much code within an if that it won't all fit on the screen, that's, that's just bad, bad coding, and you should change that. Um, okay, fine, I'm not, going to, <laughs> I'm not going to argue about that one way or the other. The, the point here is that Python does have these very rigid rules about indentation, and you just have to learn to live with those. Well, so... I have been typing this code interactively to my Python shell, uh, but this is not very realistic. It's certainly not reusable. I don't want each time I run Python to have to retype all of my code over and over again. So as I get into writing more complex code that I would like to be able to save and execute later, involving decisions, loops, functions, classes, and so on. I want to have an editor that I can use to write code in a file that I can save. Idle has an editor contained within it, uh, which is very simple-minded. It's basically like Windows Notepad. And I can start the editor running by clicking File and New File. Now that new file window got created on a different screen on my system so let me drag this thing over where we can see it and set its size to be reasonable okay here we go okay so here i have my idle editor in which i can type code that i can save Later, when I want to execute the code contained within this file, I will, I will first have to save the file, and then I can go to the Run menu and click Run Module. Or, you'll notice that there's a shortcut key here as well. I can just press F5 to run the code contained within the module. All right. 
Now, in the interactive shell, let me revert back to my interactive shell for a moment. If I say A gets hello, and then I just type the name of this variable A, the interactive shell automatically displays for me the representation of this string. So what I get as output is hello in quotes. But that's not going to occur in a saved program. In a saved program, I have to use a function, the print function, to see the value of a variable or of a literal or of some kind of expression. And by default, the print function is going to display the values that I give it as arguments separated from each other with spaces. Okay, so let me switch back to the editor now to show you what I'm talking about. Here is my editor. And in here, let me say A gets hello, and then A. Okay, so that's all I've got in my file right now. You may not be able to see this, but up at the top, I'm being told that the file is untitled at this point. I have not created a name for this file. So let me say file save as and give this thing a name. Now I'm going to put this into a directory called dfp a4 2020 and I'm going to call this thing prog1. Okay, so I now have created a file whose name is prog1.py and let me run this thing. You, you may or may not be able to see that, whoops, I moved the window by accident. You may or may not be able to see that this thing now does have the name prog1. Uh, prog1.py. So let me say run, run module. Now, in order to run the module, what happens is that the editor hands this module to the shell, and the shell executes all of the code in this module, uh, all of the code in this file, uh, first by restarting itself. When you restart the shell, the shell uh, the shell forgets everything that it used to know. So in my interactive session, I had defined these variables A, B, C, and so forth. Uh, I also had a couple of lists, M and P, where N was a reference to the same list as M. But most of those variables are now gone. B no longer exists, C no longer exists, M no longer exists, P no longer exists, because the shell was restarted. A does exist, but A now refers to hello, because that's what we set that variable A to refer to in my code file. All right, now when I ran this thing, you may have noticed that nothing was displayed. All right, even though I gave A as a statement, when I run a program, that does not cause the value of A to be displayed. Instead, what I have to say is print A. Alright, so there's my revised program in which I'm printing the value of the object that A refers to. So let me save that and run it. Run, run module. There, and now we got hello. This time, the output produced by print does not show the internal representation, including the quotes. What it shows, we hope, is a human-readable representation, which for the string hello is just the five characters, H-E-L-L-O. Print also automatically adds a new line at the end so that hello comes out on a line by itself, and the prompt is on the next line down. Okay. So, I can give as many arguments to print as I like, and what print will do is to display human-readable representations of those values separated by spaces with defaults, or, or by default. So let me do that. 
instead of just printing A, let me print A followed by the string Bob and then the float, 11 thirds. Remember that division of an int by an int division period always yields a float. And I've also got a Boolean value true. So when I run this modified program now, I, I did, by the way, I did save this by pressing Control S. Control S in Windows will save your file. So I press Control S. And this time, rather than saying run, run module, I'm going to use the shortcut. I'm going to press F5. And there we are. Okay, so I got the value of the object that A refers to, which is hello. Then the value of this literal object, Bob. The value of this result of division, 11 thirds, and true. And by default, these things are separated from each other with spaces. I do want to point something out about the value that I'm seeing here for 11 thirds, which is that the representation displayed for a float by default will be as many digits as possible, but the last digit is always going to be some kind of garbage. Uh, the correct representation for this value, if it were rounded, let's say, would be 3.66666 and then the last digit ought to be a 7. But in this case, the last digit is, is a 5. So it's, it's really just kind of some kind of round off uh, error resulting from the floating point representation in the machine. All right, now I can, to many functions, provide what are called keyword arguments, which will modify the behavior of the function. And a keyword argument always has this form. You have some variable name, which is used internally within the function that you're calling, and then an equal sign and a value that you want to use for that internal variable. So here I'm using a keyword argument called sep as the last value in my print function call, and that allows me to specify that I would like a different separator than the default space characters that are used. Keyword arguments always have to come after the so-called positional arguments. The positional arguments are just given from left to right, you know, first argument, second argument, third argument, etc. Let me try this modified <coughs> print function call. I am going to copy and paste this line, but in the second print statement here, I'm going to say sep gets a comma. So now I'm going to have a displayed by the first print function call. Then I'm going to have a bob 11 thirds true. That print statement, that print function call will display those values separated with space characters. And the final print function call will display those same values, but this time separated with commas instead. So the output should look like what's shown here on the bottom of slide 55. Don't seem to be able to highlight these commas. There we go. There we go. Okay, so let's, let's see this thing run. Control S to save and F5 to run. And indeed, there we are. Okay, so I uh, so in my third print function call, I have commas being used as the separator between the values. This business of positional parameters coming first, whoops, sorry, highlighted more than I wanted to. Uh, positional parameters coming first to a function, followed by keyword arguments, I should say, uh, this is a facility or this is a feature of functions in Python that we're going to see again and again. Well, we've used an if decision. In general, an if decision can have three major sections. An if has to start with the keyword if, followed by some Boolean test and a colon, and then some statements indented within that if part. 
Optionally, you can have an elif, and in fact, you can have as many elifs as you want. Elif is simply short for else if, of course. At the end, optionally, you're allowed to have one else part. Okay, so the general form of an if decision looks like if some test is true, then do some statements. Elif, some other test is true, do some statements. And then perhaps elif, some third test is true, do some statements. Elif, some fourth test is true, do some statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until eventually we come down to at most one else. If none of these Boolean expressions were successful or true, do some other set of indented statements. Now, I will, I will make a confession to you, and I don't know why this is the case, but uh, I mentioned that you have to have a colon at the end of your if statement, and you also have to have a colon at the end of your elif statement. Furthermore, you have to have a colon at the end of your else. And for whatever reason, despite how long I've been writing this code, uh, half the time I'm going to forget that colon after the else. So we'll, we'll see. Now that, I've, now that I've confessed that I do that, I probably won't make that mistake. But if you do find yourself getting complaints when you run Python code involving decisions or loops, the first thing to check for is to make sure that you didn't forget your colon at the end of your if or your elif or your else. Let me uh, do a little example of an if else, uh, pardon me, an if elif else. So let's say uh, b gets 12, c gets 13, d gets 20. I can say if a is equal to hello print a is equal to now remember that I can use a backslash in front of a quote mark to allow a literal quote mark to be contained within a string. I could instead have used double quotes to contain this string so that I did not need to put backslashes in front of the quotes. But I didn't think to type a double quote when I started, so I just uh, went ahead and used the backslash to allow my quote to be uh, incorporated. All right, so if a is equal to hello, print a is equal to hello. Uh, notice that my editor here also, when I hit the enter key, assumes that I want to stay indented at the same level to continue my if, but I don't want to be indented any longer. Let me hit a backspace, and I'll say elif b is less than c, print b is less than c. Now here I happen to have typed double quotes for my string since I spend a good part of my time writing C++ code. I frequently type double quotes for strings even though uh, it's more it's more conventional in Python to use single quotes but you can as we've shown use either single quotes or double quotes they mean the same thing. And then finally else print None of the above. OK, so there's an example of an if, elif, else. Now, because a is equal to hello, uh, that first test will succeed. And so I'll execute the first print statement. Let me save this and run it. OK, so I get hello is equal to hello. But let me just change this to a not equal and run it and now I get told 12 is less than 13 because the value of B which is 12 is less than the value of C which is 13 and so this line is displayed if I were to change this thing to greater than 
then I would finally get down to the else part. None of the above. Okay, so that's that's all there is to the if, elif, else structure. One form of loop is called the while loop. And here also you have a Boolean expression that's evaluated for true or false. Uh, if that Boolean expression is true, then all of the statements that are indented within the while are executed. Generally speaking, you have to initialize some kind of variable before you get to the while test. And you have to remember to increase or decrease or in some other way change that variable at the bottom of your while loop to prevent yourself from having an infinite loop. So let me show a loop here. Now, if I say print with no argument, that is fine. And it turns out that what happens is that nothing followed by a new line is what's displayed. And I've done that here in order to put a line of separation between the output coming from the if, elif, else decision and the output coming from this while loop. So if I say i gets a 0, and then while i is less than 10, print i and increase i by 1. All right, so there I've got two statements contained within my while. What I'm going to get here is 10 lines of output containing values of i going from 0 up to 9. Now, when I get to i equals 10, the loop test will fail, and I'll be done in the loop. So let's see whether this does what I claim. All right, I've pressed Control-S to save, and now I'm going to press F5. Yes, so notice there I got my blank line, and now I have these values 0 through 9. I showed you the SEP keyword argument uh, that changes the separator between arguments to print from space to, col uh, to, to comma in this case. There's also another keyword argument called END, which by default is new line. But if I set end equal to space, then at the end of each output line, a space will be displayed rather than a new line. This change here, where I say print i with end set equal to space, is going to display all these integers on a single line rather than on separate lines. So let me show you this. There we go. So so my first, quote, line, unquote, of output was 0 followed by space. That is a 0 followed by the end of the line, which is a space. And then the second line was 1 space. And the third line was 2 space, and so on. And so actually out here is a 9 and a space. And once that was uh, completed, um, I just got an automatic new line before the shell display its uh, prompt. All right, so that's an illustration of the while loop. Now, there are all kinds of problems with while, nam namely or generally that you will either forget to set your initial value for your variable correctly, or even worse, you will forget to change the value of the variable correctly. If I accidentally left out this i plus gets 1, I would then have an infinite loop, which would keep displaying successive values of i forever until eventually I got sick of looking at this output and hit uh, control c to interrupt my, my program. It's remarkably easy, even for an experienced programmer, to forget to include the change necessary in the while loop to cause the while loop to conclude. Alrighty. The second kind of loop, and actually a much more common kind of loop in Python, is a for loop. The for loop steps through each of the items in a so-called iterable. 
<laughs> now, an iterable. What is an iterable? Well, an iterable is something that you can iterate through or step through one item at a time. A sequence object, such as a list, is one example of an iterable. It turns out also that a string is also a sequence and, and therefore can be used as an iterable. So in general, our for loop looks like this. We have the keyword for, and then some variable, which is any identifier name that we wish to make up. Then we have the keyword in, followed by the iterable, which might be a list, might be a stir, or might be various other kinds of iterables that we'll discover. Again, like the if and like the for, uh, while loop, we have to have a colon at the end of that for statement at the top of our for loop. Contained within the for loop is some arbitrary number of indented statements. All right, so as a couple of examples, let's see, I actually have, no, I don't because I've restarted my shell. So I don't have any lists sitting around. But I can use a literal list, as shown here in the example on slide 58. So for, and now I'm going to use the loop variable i, in, and here I have a list of values, 1, 5, 9, minus 4, 12. Whoops. Okay, so for i in, this list of values, 1, 5, 9, minus 4, 12, I'm going to print i squared. Okay, i to the second power. <clears throat> and remember that print, by default, displays output on separate lines. Or, or I should say, displays a new line at the end of each line that's printed. There we are. So I have 1 squared is 1, 5 squared is 25, 9 squared is 81. Minus 4 squared is 16, and 12 squared is 144. If I had a list with a variable that referred to the list, like m here, I could say for, uh, just pick a different name, k in m, print k plus 10, let's say, whatever. There we go. So I have 11, 12, 18, 24, each value plus 10. If I use a stir as my iterable, now Python does not have a separate notion of a care value as we do in Java or C++. Instead, what we get when we iterate through a stir is one character substrings from that stir. All right, so if I say for C in hello, well, hello is a five character stir, and C is going to be set initially to the one character substring H, and then the one character substring E, and then the first L, and the second L, and finally the O. <clears throat> All right, so I get the, the five one-character substrings of hello, uh, one per line, H-E-L-L-O. Now, another form of iterable is something called the range function, which gives me a convenient way of stepping through a sequence of integer values. If I say for some variable in range and then give one argument, Let's do that for j in range 5, let's say. Let's print j. Now, range will deliver to me values starting from 0 up to, but not including, 5. So the values that I will get for j as I iterate through this range are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but not 5. Okay, so this argument 5 that I gave to the range is one beyond the end of the values that j will receive. If I give two arguments to the range, 
then the first argument is the initial value, and the second argument is one past the final value. And by default, I step forward one at a time. So if I say for j in range 5 comma 10, let's say, then the first value I'm going to get will be 5. The final value that I get is going to be 1 less than 10, so that will be 9. And I'll just get successive values. All right, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <clears throat> Finally, I can specify a step size as a third argument to the range function if I wish. So if I say for j, well, k, whatever. <laughs> I mistyped it, but it'll work fine. Uh, range, uh, oh, I don't know, let's say 10 to 30 with a step size of 3. Okay, so I'm going to get 10, and then 13, 16, 19, 22, uh, up to but not including 30. All right, so I've got a sequence of seven values here from 10 up to 28, but not including 31, because that's beyond 30, as my result. If I use a negative step size, I can count downwards. So in this second example here on slide 60, I'm saying for i in range starting from 4 down to, but not including, minus 1 with a step of minus 1. So this is sort of like a countdown, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, we will discover in next week's lecture other kinds of containers like tuples and sets and dictionaries that we can also use as iterables with a for loop to step through all of the values in those containers. All right, well, that's all we're going to do for this week. I will do the last few slides about modules at the beginning of next week's lecture. I will be posting an assignment uh, shortly, and you'll have a week to accomplish that first assignment. The first assignment is, frankly, not very difficult. All right, well, uh, take care of yourselves, and have a good week, and I'll be in touch with more information as the week goes by. All right, take care.